He probably had bass all the way down there. He what? He played like he did. What? And then start nipping knobs. <coughs> oh, I thought he probably had the bass turned all the way down. But you all look great this morning. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know you can't help it. But uh, let's join together. Let's sing.
joined in. She had said that that was her desire, that the Lord would take her soon. And God honored her request. But pray for the Jones uh, family. The, her mother's name is Maxine Huffman. Huffman family. And then um, Marilyn Clark will be having hip surgery this week. Father, thank you that you know us by name. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you're concerned with the very things that concern us. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who have lost loved ones recently. Or the sting of death is hurtful and painful at times. I pray, Lord, that you would be the comfort and strength that's needed on this day. Pray especially, Lord, as Marilyn's facing surgery and is and in such pain, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would give her a peace, you would give her a calmness. In knowing, Lord, that you are with her, be with her in this surgical procedure and with the doctors and the nurses who care for her. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for who you are. Not for the things that you do for us, but just because you are God. Draw close to us today. May we hear your voice. May we know of your love. May we open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to your word today. These things we pray in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the 
Amen. Aren't you glad that we come just as we are, without anything else, just the way that we are? I come broken to be mended. I come to be healed. And Jesus accepts us. What a great song. Thank you. Thank you, choir, for sharing with us. And uh, just a reminder, this is the 20th of February. Did you know that? You lose track of time. We are uh, three quarters of the way through February already. And uh, today is Alabaster Sunday. And you go, man, I forgot that. Well, it's okay. We'll take it next week. It's just fine. And out in the foyer, you saw the big alabaster box. You can just dump your chains in there or a check or cash or however you want to give to the building of missions. And uh, it uh, goes toward helping uh, build schools and buy properties and uh, do many, many things that uh, 100% of it goes toward those projects. And in doing so, you're helping to build the kingdom. You don't have to roll anything. Um, the uh, Missions Council uh, last uh, September spent the afternoon and got together and they rolled all the coin, only to be taken to the bank and said, you're going to have to unroll all that. Um, so they had to unroll it and they run it through a machine and they do the counting and all that good kind of stuff. So that's a, that's a benefit. Um, I guess they thought maybe we were trying to fill in between with slugs. I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, but it's a safeguard, I'm sure. But uh, do participate in that. Be a part of that as well. And then I want to remind you that uh, the 19th of March is our ladies' event here at the church. And uh, you can see uh, Debbie Fields in the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet out there. And they need to have a number in order to prepare your wonderful brunch that you'll receive and uh, get all the materials together. So invite someone to join you. It's not just for our church. It can be for any lady who wants to come and uh, learn and grow and be nourished. So I, I trust that you'll take advantage of that opportunity. And then tonight, ladies, you have another opportunity at 6 o'clock tonight in the Fellowship Hall area or one of the classrooms, Barbara Keys and uh, uh, Beth Layton will be leading a study. Um, I forgot what it was. Warrior women. Yes, warrior women on Deborah. And so you want to plan to uh, be a part of that at 6 o'clock. That's one of our life groups. That'll be meeting on Sunday evening. And then Sunday evening here in the sanctuary, Pastor Bill Burdett will be preaching. His granddaughter, Sydney, will be uh, singing, leading the singing for us. And you want to plan to be a part of that. Also on Wednesday evening, in conjunction with uh, um, Amy and uh, Belinda's life group that meets at 6.30, uh, there will be a new Bible study beginning. First Peter here at the, uh, in the sanctuary on Wednesday evening at 6.30. Be reminded that time changed. It's Wednesday evening activities begin at 6.30. That's um, uh, Amy and Belinda's class, choir, and the sanctuary class all begin at 6.30. You can come join us for a meal at 5.30 and uh, then just be ready to stick around and be a part of, of all that's happening. So it is good to be in the house of the Lord. I want to thank... Um, uh, Pastor Craig for filling in. I want to thank Steve and Sheila and Joe for filling in at uh, Charleston First Church. Um, and uh, they, were, they were pleased. I asked them and they said, yeah, he's a good guy. So uh, if you didn't believe that, now believe it because outside people from the church have said so. But I do appreciate Steve and uh, uh, his willingness to serve. And we'll be hearing from him here at first, at, uh, where am I? Elk River. I can blame things on COVID brain now, can I? Oh, okay. Well, that sounds good. That sounds good. But I trust that uh, you'll take advantage of all the opportunities that uh, are around us and available to us and to uh, be a part of that. The young adult class still meeting at 7 o'clock on Sunday evenings if you want to be a part of that. Open your hearts to Maddie as she comes to share with us.
So I yield to you and to your careful hand When I trust you I don't need to understand Make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be God I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring new wine out of me in the crushing in the pressing you are making new In the soil I now surrender You are breaking new ground You are breaking new ground So make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want God, I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring the wine out of me Jesus, bring the wine out of me Jesus, bring the new freedom and the kingdom is here I lay down my old flame to carry your new fire today cause where there is new wine there is new power there is new freedom So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Amen. 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 Thank you. I never called my dad, my father. I always called him dad or daddy. When he was little, I called him daddy. When my mother, when I was little, I called my mom mommy. But when I became 18 years old, <laughs> I was able to call the creator of this world my father do you realize what an honor it is to be able to say in your heart that you're a child of the living God oh I love him this morning I love my savior (laughs) 
And one day, praise the Lord, I'm going to go home. It might be soon, who knows? But who's worried about it? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I love Jesus. I know He loves me. And I know that He went to Calvary and died that I could be able to stand and testify of that fact. You pray that I never lose a desire to tell others about it. Because he did die. He gave his life for me and for me. Praise the Lord, most everybody that's in this auditorium. Stay faithful to God. Tell others about it. Don't be ashamed. And like I said, pray for me, I pray. I'll be faithful. that he chooses to make new wine out of us. He takes us empty and broken and he forms us into what he desires. This morning I want to ask you a question and I want us to uh, understand this morning about being unstoppable. When I say the phrase unstoppable, what comes to your mind? I don't know, if you grew up in my uh, age group, it would have been Superman. Who can leap uh, the highest buildings? Who can do all of these things? And it would have been Superman. In today's day and age, it would be uh, Captain America, Iron Man, um, all, all of those guys that we consider unstoppable. They're there for the good of things, and they, they, they're determined to do what is right but I want us to understand that in our personal lives, those are, those are characters. Those are, pe- are, are um, uh, things that have been invented to, to sort of give us hope and give us understanding that right will always prevail. But in our own personal lives, sometimes we might feel unstoppable when we're 20 years old. Or maybe it's that promotion that you got or or what you're working toward in your life and it makes you feel as if you're unstoppable as to what you can accomplish in your life. But what about? What about when the word cancer comes into that unstoppable life? What about when the bottom fell out of your life financially? What about when that spouse chooses to leave? What about illegal behavior that's occurred in your life that had been hidden? We suddenly find ourselves stoppable. We find ourselves in a place that stops us in our tracks. And in most cases, it causes us to reevaluate our lives. The truth of the matter is this. When it comes to technology and innovation and profits, we see people who appear to be unstoppable and building their kingdom while here on earth. But there's also those who... uh, in every sports dynasty, who you look at their life and you think, man, they are just right on top of their game and and they are just unstoppable. How about that successful business? It's unstoppable. What about that legendary icon that you think about or athlete? But can I tell you that even every entertainer will eventually fade away. They, they have their moment of glory. They have their period of time of, of fame and fortune. But that too will, will fade away. 
So I want us to be reminded today that the only unstoppable force in this world today comes from God. God's creation, God's church, God's purpose, and God's people. And it's nothing that we do that makes it unstoppable. It is the spirit of God that makes it unstoppable. And when we begin to get that in perspective, when we begin to understand that, I want us to look at a a particular life, the life of Paul. We're going to be looking at scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He was an amazing Christian, yet he faced all kinds of opposition in his life. He faced opposition from believers He faced opposition from those who formerly he had supported in the persecution of Christians. But yet Paul decided, made a choice that to follow Jesus and not stop or give up. The Bible tells us that Paul had people who were saying that his teachings were weak that he wasn't qualified. They even accused him of being dishonest and of corrupting God's word. If you read the scripture, you'll find that when he first went back to the Christians to explain what had happened on the Damascus road, they didn't believe him. They were skeptical. They wanted to stay away from him for surely it was a trick of some kind. People were hurtful, unappreciative, saying he lacked integrity. But when you follow his life, you find that they beat him with sticks. They threw stones at him. And they even left him for dead. I don't know about you. It would take a lot of intestinal fortitude to keep pressing forward with all of that against me. It would have been easy just to give up, but he didn't quit. He never gave up. He kept pressing on. Paul possessed some qualities that I want us to understand can help us in moving forward, in staying strong for the Lord, in being unstoppable in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul had unstoppable determination. Now, if we recall and remember, Paul was once Saul. Saul had taken it very personal that he was going to destroy Christianity all by himself. I mean, he took every effort that he could. He went in every direction that he could to destroy, kill Christians. Frighten them. Whatever the method, he was going to stamp Christianity off the face of the earth. So is it any wonder that when he appeared back to the believers, that they questioned his integrity and what he was doing? But if you study Paul, you'll find that he had a strong heart for God. Once he had that experience, that personal encounter on the Damascus Road, it changed him completely. Look at verse 1 in chapter 4. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we will never give up. Paul is speaking for himself. He's saying, since I have had this encounter, since I have experienced Christ in my own life, I am never going back to where I was. Do we have that same determination? Why does he feel this way? He says, I deserve nothing. Wouldn't you feel the same way knowing that you had literally killed Believers, just because they were Christians. But let's look at what he wrote in his letter to Timothy. 
He said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service or his ministry, his work. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now we can look at Paul and say, well, yeah, he was a, he was a bad guy. But the truth is, he was no worse than you or me. We were all sinners. We were all walking in ignorance and in unbelief until we encountered Jesus. Paul knew who he was. He knew what he had done. He remembered where he came from. And he said these words, I cannot help but serve God and love God and do whatever he wants me to do, including going through tough challenges where people oppose me and criticize and attack me. Paul became a humble man, unstoppable in his heart for God, making that choice, making that decision for the Lord. Isn't it amazing that ordinary people, people that you would never think of, God chooses to use for ministry? God had chosen him. God had placed it in his heart, and he was determined to do it no matter what. It wasn't just his own strength. It wasn't just in his own mind and determination. He had been empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. He was a man on a mission. Now, when you think back to Saul, Saul had personal uh, reasons that he wanted to make a name for himself, to be seen by the the political people of the day of being supportive of uh, and against this new sect of religion that was occurring around him. Paul was doing things then for his own name. You see, when he would enter the area, people would recognize him for who he was, believer and non-believer. So that brings us to the point that Paul had unstoppable integrity after his encounter with Christ. In verse two, he says, we reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. Paul is saying, I reject all the shameful things and deeds that have been done. And now I'm on a new path, a new direction. You can count on me to tell you the truth. You can count on me that I will never distort what God's word says because it has become a part of who I am. Paul carried out his ministry with integrity, no matter how much opposition he faced. He worked like he was working directly for God. Wow, isn't that what the scripture says that we're to do? That in everything that we do, we do it as if we're doing it for the Lord himself. He recognized that God was his supervisor and he only answered to him. Paul knew his his job was to deliver God's word accurately, clearly, clearly. And effectively, even if people didn't want to hear it. If there's anything that needs to happen in our world, in our society today, it's that that we deliver the word of God accurately, clearly, and effectively, even if the world doesn't want to hear it. We stand firm on his word. The third thing that I want us to see is 
Paul had unstoppable humility. After his encounter with with Christ on the Damascus Road, his whole perspective changed. Paul recognized that God was his source. In verse 5, it says, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. Quite the contrary to the way that he had lived his life prior. It was all about Saul. It was all about the attention that he got. It was all about the numbers that he turned in in his persecution. Everything that he did was to lift up Saul. And now Paul, in this transforming moment of his life, is saying, we don't go around preaching Paul. We don't go around telling people that this is my gospel. We give credit where credit is due and we preach Jesus Christ is Lord. He was more interested in building up Christ than anything about himself. He proclaimed Jesus Christ is Lord. Simple message, simple truth. And our responsibility comes in the same manner of saying that we are to let people see God through us. May they not see myself, but may they sense and know of God's presence in and through my life. In verse 6, it says, For God, who said, Let there be light in darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts, so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul's referring back to Genesis, where God spoke the darkness to the darkness and said, Let there be light and light was shown. Paul is relating that to say, what I have experienced in my life, I was walking in darkness and I saw the light and the face of Jesus Christ that changed me and transformed me. The message is this, that the good news is revealed to everyone. It's available to everyone. But the truth is, some choose to refuse it. It's a matter of choice, a matter of decision. They reject the light and choose to remain in the darkness. Satan, the God of this world, works to deceive and blind and destroy everyone that he possibly can. Scripture in in chapter 11, verse 14, says Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. It's not what we think, is it? I mean, we have pictured in our mind these horns that uh, come out, you know, angel on the right side, devil on the left side, red tail, red body, ugly, scary. And the truth of the matter is that Satan is very attractive and can use the lure of power and pleasure and success to blind people from the light of Christ. When we opt for our own selfish pursuits over Christ, we are unknowingly saying yes to Satan. We're unknowingly saying yes I choose to serve here and not serve the Lord. Paul went on to say in verse 7, we now have the light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing the great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not 
from ourselves. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing a great treasure. What we have to understand here is that in the day of, of um, this period of time, clay jars were just a, a common thing to have around. You'd find them everywhere. They weren't ornamental. They weren't something that uh, was made and crafted in such a way to be something beautiful. But they were, they were just uh, containers. Maybe like our Tupperware or um, whatever the, the popular thing is now. Something that you just put stuff in. It could be anything. It didn't have to be food. It, it could be something you, you stored um, jewelry in. It could be something that uh, you just had handy so you emptied your belongings into it. But they were so, so fragile and, and made maybe so quickly that you had to be careful with them. Now, there were plenty around, but if the jar broke, you lost your contents in some sense. So he's making that for us to understand that we, this body of clay, are just clay jars that are to be filled with the great treasure, that are to be filled with the things of God. God's mercy, his love, his grace is stored within us, just ordinary clay jars. It's what is inside that's valuable. It's not how you look. It's not what you do. It's not what you own but it's what is on the inside that matters. We also understand that Paul was living an unstoppable life. In verses eight and nine, he goes on and he says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. He's saying to us, just like Jesus, who went to the grave, who died on the cross, went to the grave, and they thought they were done with him. But he rose on the third day, giving life and hope for the future. We see ourselves that we are not giving up no matter what presses in on us or around us. You see, Paul in his writing is not trying to sugarcoat the Christian life. He's not trying to say, oh, life is going to be good. You'll have all that you ever needed, all you ever wanted. No, he's saying you've got to understand you're going to get knocked down but you won't be destroyed. You're going to be confused, perplexed, but you'll not be driven by despair. God will never abandon you. He's explaining that the unstoppable life of following Christ involves every aspect of life. The old good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all about following him. So why did Paul have to go through all this? Well, he answers that question in verse 10, and he says, through sufferings, our body continues to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. It's saying that when we are pressed, hard pressed, when we are knocked down, when we don't surrender and we don't give up, it's saying to us and to others that Jesus Christ is supreme. 
and he will be with us. Paul is saying, I'm willing to suffer for Christ. I'm doing it so that Christ might be revealed in my life. Don't count your sufferings as a loss. Don't count your difficulties as a loss. Count them as a privilege for standing for what is right, for doing what is good. We have unstoppable faith. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. I'm glad that I can say that I live in America and I'm not facing constant danger of death because I believe in Jesus. But there are people all over the world who are facing that very same thing today, who are hiding just to pray in the name of Jesus. He goes on and says, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. Even if you have to give your life, make sure that it is known. And I sort of think because Saul was there when Stephen was stoned. And life went out of his body. And I kind of picture Paul as he was writing this saying, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. You remember how Stephen died with his eyes fixed on what was above him. I can't help but believe that that was etched in Saul, Paul's mind. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us up. Jesus and <coughs> presented us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit and as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. Paul's saying again, it's not about me. It's not about your death or my death. It's about God receiving glory in my life. Verses 16 and 17, Paul says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying and our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. How about us? Is the power of God at work in your life? Are you allowing his strength to be made perfect in your weakness? Maybe you feel like you're ready to give up. Maybe there's something in your life that just makes you want to say, I'm just going to surrender, forget it, just throw it all away and quit. I believe we can take from this scripture, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Even when you wanna give up, even when you think there's no use, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. 
First Peter tells us that we're to be self-controlled and alert, that the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour someone, seeking to confuse us, seeking to lead us on the wrong path. In 2 Timothy, it says, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. Of power, of love, and self-discipline. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. We're not alone. We're not alone. Even when you feel like giving up, God is with us. He'll never leave us. He provides the power for us to live an unstoppable life of faith. Here's something that I want you to remind yourself of on a regular basis. Sincere Christ followers are victors, never the victim. Hear it again. A sincere Christ follower is a victor, not a victim. Are you unstoppable? Have you surrendered your faith completely to the Lord? Are you allowing him to move in us, through us, standing firm, not being moved. Where are you today? We're truly living in a war zone. We're fighting a spiritual battle. We shouldn't be surprised that life gets hard sometimes. Satan knows that time is running out. And right now, he'll do whatever he can do to discourage, to defeat God's people. He doesn't play fair. But we have to be the one who makes the determination that says, I will stand firm. I will not be moved. For with Christ by my side, I'll make it through. Have you resolved within your heart to follow Jesus with all that you are? No matter what trials, no matter what disease, no matter what comes into your path tomorrow or this afternoon, Will your faith not waver because of the decision that you have made? George Muller provided for thousands of orphans in his day. When asked how he was able to accomplish so much with all of the challenges and trials that he faced, He hung his head and he said, there was a day when I died. And he hung his head even a little lower. And he said, I died to George Muller. Have you died to self to be determined? follow Jesus. Would you bow your heads? Kelly's going to sing. Maybe you're at a place where you feel like you're at the end of your rope. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe you haven't stood strong very well. But today, you want to be an unstoppable Christian for Jesus Christ. 
you want to make that determination to be a follower and stand firm. Kelly's going to sing. We're going to close in prayer. Maybe you want to come and pray about something. Maybe you need to surrender something. Maybe you need to die to self in order for God to use you. You to be available to stand strong, unmoved. Would you respond as Kelly sings? sing that first verse and if that is your, the desire of your heart and you affirm that within your soul and spirit be a person of integrity don't stand if you don't mean it or you're not ready to make that commitment but as Kelly leads us if that is your testimony would you stand and sing with us I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. We bow in your presence this morning thanking you that you promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. Lord, even though in our lives we have failed and made mistakes and Lord, we were sinners that have been saved by grace and we thank you. Help us, Lord, to stand and not be moved. Help us, Lord, to stand firm and to be people of integrity, humility, and reflecting you in our life and in our faith. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thankful, Lord, for your word that speaks to our hearts. Be with us as we go from this place. And may we go rejoicing in knowing that we serve a living Savior. And in the name of Jesus, we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen. God bless you.